definition of a professional band is one that plays and records music for money. And the third piece of that is that they actually talk to the media. It's crucial to any band that they get heard, that people know they're there, that they're performing. In their early days, that's exactly what Nirvana want. The stereotype is that Nirvana hated talking to the media. And initially, it's not true. They start in 1987, and they're just another struggling local band who would love to talk to people. They want people to know they're playing. By 88, they're starting to get a little bit of attention. By 89, they're happy to go on radio all the time. They even do the call sign for a radio station at one point. They just turn up, and they enjoy it. They like talking to the people they're talking to. One of the crucial things in those early days is that they're always talking to fellow fans. They're talking to fanzines, they're talking to small local stations where the person talking to them loves alternative and underground music. So for them it's a pleasure. They get to go on, they get to goof around, they get to make jokes with people. They just talk, they're happy to talk about anything people want to talk about. Gradually that attention builds in 1990-1991. The funny thing is that they're still just another unknown band. They're still just talking to the smaller magazines. The only exception is Europe. As late as August 1991, there's an interview with a gentleman from Metal Hammer magazine. And in it, they talk about, oh, we, we hope the single will do all right. And they talk about, oh, wouldn't it be funny to do a tour with Guns N' Roses? That would be so ri ridiculous. That would be fun. And then a month later, the singles come out, and they're only just starting to realise that it's the biggest single of the year, and in fact one of the biggest singles of the decade. What's beautiful about looking at their interviews in the way I did for Cobain on Cobain is seeing that development, a band reacting in the moment to what's going on. From late 1991, they've got to learn to cope with what they've unleashed. They are interviewing for full days at a stretch. If you can imagine, I'm sitting in a room for eight hours just answering questions, and often the same question again and again and again. There's a gentleman from Canada, Canadian TV who is very honest. He says he saw the Smells Like Teen Spirit video. He was meant to interview them. He'd never heard of them before. He had to ask them in the interview more or less who they were. So by the end of that year, Nirvana are getting a reputation for being difficult with the press. It's simply because they're talking constantly to people who don't know their references, don't know the bands they're into, don't know who they are. Things go very wrong in late 1992, very wrong. His child is taken into care at one point, his heroin addiction is splashed across all the media, he feels people are out to get him and his wife, his paranoia is increasing. The way he counterattacks is fascinating. He does it with the media. And suddenly he's not talking to small music magazines, he's talking to the New York Times. He's doing interviews with major national publications that are more into entertainment news than music news because he's suddenly become a celebrity. It doesn't work the way he wants, he retreats again. The final burst of publicity the band engage in is late 1993 and it's a very deliberate show of unity. The band suddenly do all the in utero publicity as a band again the three of them all together doing several days where they just talk to media. 1994 is difficult. The band retreat more than they have done before. They do a bare smattering of interviews because unlike their early years, they just don't have to anymore. So they don't. What you'll see is Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic on radio in Portugal and they're asked what the future of the band is. And they look a bit sheepish. They've been goofing around all afternoon, they've been making jokes, they've been putting on accents, and suddenly they look a little bit nervous and embarrassed. And they more or less confess that they're not really sure what it is. Oh, we're, we have some tour plans, that's about it, that's what we're doing for now. The final media broadcast by Kurt Cobain, it's the suicide note. And that's a sad thing to end on, but read it. That note is a public address, it's not a private note. It's something intended to be consumed by an audience. And he knows what will happen. By this point, he's used to the fact that everything he says will be taken, publicised, consumed. That note is designed to speak to an audience that he didn't necessarily want to talk to. By that point in his life, he didn't want his life on display. And yet the final thing he does is he writes this note that's talking to that audience. Isn't that a funny one?